Yeah, Sudan's trans transitional justice uh, with an organization called ACHPR, uh, and it stands for um, wait African Commission on Human and People's Rights. And that definition, that acronym is going to be on the final exam. So I hope everybody wrote it down, yeah? <laughs> and our guest today is uh, Cynthia Ibali, and she is in Kampala, Uganda, right now as we speak. Thank you for joining us, Cynthia. Thanks for having me. So let's get a handle on, um, you know, first of all, um, your role with Project Expedite Justice. You're a lawyer. Um, and what country are you from and what countries did you spend time educating yourself? So, uh, yes, I am a human rights lawyer uh, based in Kampala, Uganda. I am, I, am, I am Ugandan, born and raised, but I did um, my higher education outside of Uganda. So I did my bachelor's in South Africa at the University of Pretoria. I've done the postgraduate legal um, diploma um, with the uh, Institute for Legal Practice and Development in Rwanda. And then uh, fairly recently, but not really, <laughs> uh, was my master's in uh, 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 master's of law in human rights with the Central European University in Budapest. Wow, been all over. Travel, travel is broadening, they say, and it's certainly, uh, you know, the statement of your training and career so far is, is a statement about the connection, so many African countries and the connection of Africa with Europe. Uh, so interesting, you know, in, in the U.S. and in Hawaii, we don't, we don't really mm. realize that. We don't, we don't really understand that. But the fact is the world is changing. Africa is changing. Africa's relations with other places changing and your generation is changing so my question to you this is not a this is not an easy one okay is all of that why why are you doing this so i think i will sound a bit cliche but uh, my interest in law grew out of me wanting to help people using the law um knowing that law is quite a powerful tool when it comes to uh, social justice and other issues. So that's why I started out with uh, my law degree in South Africa. And uh, as I was doing law at undergrad level, I then was exposed to human rights law. And again, based on my interest with using law to better um, people's lives, it just seemed like the perfect match. And so this is why I got into the human rights um, practice or area of interest. And um, since then, I've never looked back. I've just built um, on my expertise in this area. This is why I then went on to do a master's in the area to refine my knowledge, uh, gain more experience, um, especially uh, in terms of a comparative um, uh, experience with the European systems and the African system. So, and the um, stint, uh, or not stint, of my time in uh, in Europe. <laughs> mm. Wow. Yeah, you think you'll continue to do this for your whole life? For now, yes. <laughs> that seems like the plan. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, what's, what's Africa like these days? You know, we've done a number of shows with Project expedite justice with a number of people associated with it and looking at uh, human rights and, and, and war crimes, if you like, um, all over Africa. We've, we've also talked to Project Expedite Justice uh, Associates in, in Latin America, and for that matter, in Ukraine, which is uh, kind of a, a hot spot of its own. So um, I'm just wondering, you know, in your observation, vis-a-vis uh, -vis all of Africa, What's Africa like these days? And should we be concerned about the degradation of human rights there? Uh, should we be encouraged by what you're doing? Or are you making traction? Uh, can we talk about that? What's African like these days? That's quite a wide question. <laughs> um, uh, 
when the top of off the top of my head i don't know why the first thing i was thinking about was the high fuel prices but uh in relation to um the human rights situation in africa i think it's quite varied um i'll start up apologies with sudan because uh this is where i'm currently focused is you're having the situation with um continued um anti anti coup movement so you have quite a number of uh protests that are still occurring against the um uh military takeover or coup that happened in october 2021 but then you also have um most recently we are receiving reports of uh, communal violence in some parts of the country it's been blue nile uh, re most recently but you also have experienced some conflicts in darfur um other than that, there's also, of course, the economic situation that's not getting any better, hence the high fuel prices. When you come down to Uganda, where I'm based, um, there's, there's a lot going on. Uh, so uh, at the moment, it's definitely the economy uh, situation um, uh, people are crying over, all of us are quite worried about. And um, Yes, the economic situation needs to be overtaken. How does, that, how does that work, Cynthia? Yes. What I mean is, so you have economic troubles. There yes. are many places in the world today that have economic troubles. You're looking at human rights and violations of human rights. How do, you know, in the macro picture, in the examination of the society, how do economic troubles, like high prices, inflation, price of gas and food and so forth. How do those things le lend themselves to violations of human rights? What's the, what's the dynamic on that? I think uh, with the high prices, that kind of widens the poverty uh, situation, the poverty gap, um, access to definitely food and um, access to food. Those high prices also drives up food prices, so that that definitely puts um, a strain on access to food. Um, access to access to health is also um, affected, mm. as of course uh, with high prices that means uh, transportation, that means um, having to ferry medicines and stuff like that increase in prices so that also affects that um so, so yeah, well, how does it work so my quality of life is not as good because of the economy it's, it's falling away from under me uh i suppose i'm discouraged i suppose i'm really unhappy i suppose i'm i'm, I'm angry i want to blame somebody i don't know who to blame um so i get out in the street and and make a protest if you will and the protest uh, and if I'm if I'm off track, you tell me. The protest starts as as peaceful. It's just a statement of unhappiness with the economy and with life. Um, and then somewhere along the line, the government um, pushes back, and yes. then it becomes more violent. And before you know it, you have violence on both sides, and then the whole system begins to deteriorate. And it it winds up in violations of the human rights of the people who started this peaceful protest. Is that, is that the, the way, the, is that the MO of what happened? So, yes, um, I think you've also kind of explained the situation in Sudan and how the protest started, especially in 2018. Uh, the rise in fuel prices, uh, which also rise, uh, caused a uh, rise in basic commodities and people were fed up with, um, well, corruption, but then also is that government is not doing what it's supposed to to look out for its citizens. And so people go to the streets to protest this, uh, to voice their dissent against, you know, um, poor governance in general. And um, like you mentioned, um, they're peaceful. And they're, I think, largely, actually, largely been quite peaceful. And so when that 
security steps in is that you're pushing back with the use of force. Uh, you're shooting at an um, unarmed protesters using tear gas, live ammunition, and so forth. And then um, beating, arresting, detaining. Um, people are just peacefully protesting, who peacefully asking for, uh, you know, the government to take action, to do, to intervene in the rights of uh, prices and stuff like that. And so then you have a loss of lives, um, you have injuries that's affecting, of course, um, your health, um, especially if you're being, uh, if you're uh, uh, maimed in the process. Um, but then you also have, um, say, if it's loss of life, there's also probably breadwinners who are going, so that also affects um, households across. Uh, so it's diff different uh, types of so violence. The people in the government, okay, they're of the same nationality. They may be, who knows, they may be brothers and sisters of the people in the street. Um, and they know what life is like. They know what life is like in that community in the street. Um, and uh, is, is there no sympathy? Why does the government not understand what you have just said? Does the government not understand how how wrong it is to apply um, you know violence against peaceful protesters? Don't don't they know better? Uh, from the rhetoric, it seems they come off as quite. Um... Uh, distant from realities on the ground. Uh, we must also acknowledge they're quite privileged given uh, their positions in power and access to financial resources uh, compared to people on the ground. So they're kind of buffered from situations. Mm. Um, that's what I think. Uh, well, you know, the thing about privilege is very interesting. You know, you know, COVID has had an interesting effect on the movie industry. The movie industry, um, you know, since COVID has become global. I mean, if you want to watch a movie here uh, on Netflix uh, or Prime, Amazon Prime, you can see a, a movie in most countries in the world. I mean, you can see a movie made in Tibet. You can see a movie made in Bulgaria, which we never heard of movies before. And, and here's the point. You can see a movie made in Africa in any number of countries in Africa. And those movies explore, because it's really interesting as a matter of entertainment and education for that matter, they explore this question of privilege of those who have it and those who don't. And there's a divide, is there not, in a number of countries, another, a number of unhappy countries in Africa between privilege and not privilege. Do people understand and recognize that? The moguls in Hollywood do. <laughs> the movie makers understand it. <laughs> but do people realize that, you know, it's not healthy to have a big divide between privilege, and I guess that means money and power, as you put it, uh, and the ordinary fellow who, you know, who works at a, you know, an ordinary labor job? Um, uh, is the government interested in closing the gap? Uh, is there a way for the government to do that? Well, um, I don't know if I can speak for everyone, but I would like to think that uh, some people do. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt uh, that some people do uh, recognize and are willing to close this gap, but then you also can't um, deny or uh, not deny, but ignore the fact that there's also a number of people who benefit and uh, I'm not. So they like the gap. They like yeah. the gap. Well, they don't like the gap, but if closing the gap kind of comes at an expense that they reduce uh, money or something like that, their money, then they may, they may be, there will definitely be a pushback from them. So I guess they like uh, the comfort they're living in currently. And Change, change is hard to accept. Yeah, well, that's true. And uh, your generation has changed. And, and of course, in the US, um, we should understand this because we, are, we have our own gap, don't we? And you must see that in the media, uh, that we have our own divide 
We have people who would like to be wealthy at the expense of everyone else. We, we have people who want to be racist because they think it gets them ahead um, and, and so forth. And so when you have this gap, when you have, call it the privilege gap or the wealth gap or the power gap, it's all the same. It, it leads to a deterioration of the social fabric. Do you agree with me? Yes, I do. <laughs> so, you know, can we get to the root of this somehow? I, for example, uh, if, if, I, if I took away all the inflation, if I provided food, jobs, you know, if I fed money into the economy in Darfur, um, would this solve the problem? Uh, would this alleviate the gap and therefore, you know, the protests and therefore the violence? Uh, what is the solution? I mean, don't you think we got to go back to the root causes here and deal with them? Yes, we definitely need to. Um, I think providing food, um, money, and all the resources is good, but uh, there's also who controls the food, money, and resources. So yeah, you, you bet. The power structures and who controls how it's you know distributed. So I think we definitely need to address that as well. There's also tensions in terms of land a land as a resource that's also and also how is that um how that is um addressed in terms of fueling conflict will definitely be key um uh, in addressing the issues in the four amongst other things mm. Well, you know, I, 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 it's been going on a long time in Darfur. I mean, it's, it, we're all getting old uh, watching, watching the, the problems in Darfur. And I, and I wonder uh, how long this is going to go on and whether Project Expedite Justice can actually have a, a significant effect on the ultimate violations of human rights. So tell me how, you know, you contribute to the effort as an attorney in Kampala, uh, the effort to alleviate violations of human rights in, in, Dar in Darfur and in Sudan? So currently, uh, we are supporting or working closely with uh, groups in Sudan, including groups, uh, civil society, I must say, <laughs> let me be specific, civil society, civil society in this sense, meaning human rights organizations, uh, that are engaged in documenting violations in Sudan. We are uh, providing uh, capacity building uh, for documentation to ensure that they meet um, highest uh, standard, international standards. Um, in, this, in this sense, hoping for um, future uh, accountability in that whatever is collected is would be um, used to advocate for accountability and help victims seek redress, hopefully in the near future. Uh, and supporting also, um, say, uh, seeking redress before uh, regional, regional bodies like the African Commission on Human and People's Rights mm -hmm. or the African Committee of experts on the rights and welfare of the child. Um, I mentioned this too specifically because uh, these, um, these bodies have a mandate to oversee uh, the situation in Sudan. So, um, how, you know, how do you do that? Do you, you want to document it and yes. you want to speak, I suppose you want to deliver a package, so to speak, to the African Commission. Uh, they, they're they're the ones you're speaking to, uh, and you're, I, you know today you're also speaking to me and anybody who watches this show, uh, and I and I'm I'm with you, Cynthia. I want to see you um, prevail. I want to see you uh, make it uh, make it for accountability by these people. But how do you how do you get there? Does the commission have the power to prosecute, um, or is it limited to collecting information and attempting to make? Um, sort of public statement to embarrass the officials who have not conducted themselves in a humane way. 
So under its protective mandate, the commission can receive what they call communications um, against uh, parties to, uh, sorry, yes, parties to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. So just to backtrack, the African Charter on P Human and People's Rights, which is a founding uh, human rights instrument or treaty is, um, is what established the commission. And so to answer your question, does it have uh, the, the, the power to prosecute? It doesn't have prosecutory powers, but it does have the power to adjudicate over um, uh, cases uh, that, um, how can I put it? Uh, cases that allege, yes, that allege violations of rights in the African Charter. Mm -hmm. So um, similar to what you would have with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, if I got, <laughs> if I got it correct, so it has a similar functionality. So you can hear com what we, in our situation, call them communications. Uh, under its protective mandate, um, but there are also possibility for fact-finding missions, uh, but it would need um, approval from the African Union and also uh, cooperation from the state party that it seeks to um, conduct its fact-finding mission. Mm. Yeah, we've got to stop these violations of human rights. It's really troublesome that we still have them in 2022, and we have them in various places in the world. And I mean, I wonder, let's, let's take a, let's have a case study, Cynthia. I'm gonna have a case study. <clears throat> so suppose um, uh, my family was uh, killed or hurt or maimed uh, in, by, by security forces in, in Darfur uh, for no good reason, um, because the government is insensitive and. It just puts puts down any disturbance you know, with violence. Um, so I I want I want them to be accountable. Um, now, if I go to the commission, if I go to you as counsel, um, you're going to do an investigation. You're going to make a a package of documents, of affidavits, maybe videotapes. You know, we here at Think Tech, we we like videotapes. <laughs> And, and, and you're going to submit this package to the commission and maybe elsewhere. Um, what is the commission going to do to achieve accountability? Uh, can the commission, for example, go to the international court, uh, you know, in, in The Hague? Can the commission go into the courts of Europe seeking redress against European organizations uh, that have somehow supported this kind of violence that, and the governments that conduct this kind of violence? Um, can the individuals who are responsible, can they be fined? Uh, uh, can they go to jail by virtue of some prosecution elsewhere other than in the commission? I mean, what, what is my chance of achieving justice here? So uh, if you come to me with your case, this case study, uh, the first uh, situation is like you said, I need to gather all the facts and the evidence. But I also need to inquire if you have um, uh, tried to access uh, remedies at a domestic level, because the African Commission only comes in um, where there are no available remedies at the domestic level, or at least not available, but where you have finished exhausting remedies at the domestic level, and then um, probably not satisfied uh, with what you what, or haven't gotten a remedy, and then you go to the African Commission. But there are exceptions um, to the rule where the remedies are not available, effective, or sufficient is when you can then um, access the African Commission. The African Commission also is um, the communications procedure applies to uh, countries that are party to the African Charter. I just have to set it, uh, clarify Which that. Which is not, so, not every country. Are, 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 okay, just some countries belong to the African. Well, on Africa, on the African continent, uh, but I mean, like, we can't take a case against the U.S. to the African Commission. What about uh, what about Sudan itself? Is it a, a party? 
to the yes, it order? Is. Yeah. Yes, it is. So this is why I say they have a mandate um, over Sudan, or at least um, have jurisdiction uh, to um, uh, monitor the implementation of the African Charter in Sudan. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, um, sorry. How do, how do I get my justice? Do I get, a, get, I get a check in the mail? Um, do I hear oh, the good no. news that the people who are responsible have been have paid a price of some kind? Um, so the African, once you're, you know, uh, your communication is, uh, or case is admissible and it's decided on the merits, say you're successful, the commission issues recommendations. So um, a number of things are a finding of a violation, say in this case, a violation of um, a right to life. And also um, uh, a violation of uh, the state party's um, obligations to the charter. So in this case, is that uh, if there's no investigation that has happened, no uh, prosecution leading to the um, leading to uh, the uh, holding of uh, perpetrators accountable um it would also it can also uh, uh recommend payment of co compensation um in some cases the commission has actually uh, recommended amounts to be paid to victims um but in this case usually i it's advisable that uh as you're stating your uh, your case you request what kind of compensation you want um, the communication has also sorry, it's not the communication. The commission has also recommended uh, institutional and legal reform. So it has made recommendations. Oh, this is very that. important. Yeah. Yes, it is. Uh, it has made recommendations to um, state parties in that regard, and so that's definitely um, important in ensuring. Uh, non-recurrence of violations and also addressing uh, deficiencies at domestic levels. So is this, is it successful in the sense that, you know, you're, you're observing this and you understand, you know, the trouble people have um, and, and the need for a sort of a, um, an overarching organization beyond the remedies available in, in any one country, you need many countries to have a charter and a commission like this. And, and that's actually, it sounds to me like that's pretty good because it has a moral overtone to it. But my question to you is, is it, is it doing what you hope it would do? Is it achieving the accountability? Is it achieving um, social justice, economic justice, privilege justice, all that? Is, is, and recommends its recommendations for reform, are they being accepted? Its recommendations, or compensation to individuals, are they being are they being paid? Um, so my question is, uh, how how successful is the commission in all of the ways you have seen it operate? And let me go one step further. If you were to suggest to the commission today changes that would make it more successful, what would you suggest? Okay, so is it successful? Um, I'd like to think to an extent, yes, um, in terms of, and it also depends on what uh, victims are seeking uh, or whoever approaches a commission. But I would like to say yes, um, based off of uh, the, the decisions it has uh, granted or handed down, especially in relation to Sudan, there have been some uh, very, um, very I say promising but successful decisions mm -hmm. when it comes to protection of human rights uh, defenders who have been uh, tortured in the past, uh, but also recognizing issues in terms of um, with the uh, immunity provisions in Sudan's law that. Uh, hinder accountability uh, for, especially where you have security, security and police um, 
uh, as perpetrators of violence. Mm -hmm. um, so also, what would you say to them? Let's let's assume it's you and the members of the commission, and uh, they say, uh, Cynthia, what do you think we should do to be more effective? What's your answer? Well, I guess I would say reduce, uh, try and address the period of time it takes to uh, decide on a case. Um, I understand the commission is quite understaffed and there are also uh, resource constraints, but also the commission is, I, not I think, it is on the continent outside of domestic um, domestic remedies, it's the next uh, place that many uh, victims in Africa could go to seek um, redress or accountability for violations they've suffered, especially where these uh, states are either unwilling or unable to um, uh, to address violations domestically. It's the most accessible, if I could say it, in the way that, well, we have a commission, but we also have the African court. But we to access the African court, the number of hurdles, especially for individuals and and um, and civil society NGOs who represent many victims on the continent. With the African Commission, there's not this hindrance. So it's that anyone can access the commission. Mm, that's so, pretty valuable. Are, yes, are, the, are the country courts uh, are doing a good job? Or, I mean, it seems to me that if you have to have a commission, and you do have to have a commission, it means that at least some countries are not doing a good job. True? Well, because, you know, country courts implement um, domestic law. So, uh, yes, but then also are also a way to implement decisions or at least uh, international standards that uh, states uh, uh, ascribe, is that the word? Ascribe to? Uh, yeah. So what, yeah. what about you? Do you, Cynthia, do you appear in, in country court cases? No, I don't. Uh, not at the moment. I don't appear in country court cases. I just uh, probably follow proceedings and then come in should one seek to uh, access uh, regional systems. So, so I, you know, one last area I'd like to discuss. We, we're out of time, but I'd like to discuss this with you. You know, it strikes me that Africa in general, some countries are changing quicker than other countries. Some countries are, you know, are more enlightened than other countries, some are less. Um, but in general, Africa is changing. And the relationships of Africa and other places in the world are becoming closer and more conscious and, uh, you know, maybe even more successful. Um, and so the question I, I put to you is, you know, are you one of only a small number of lawyers um, in Kampala or other cities around, you know, Central Africa um, that are doing this? Or is this a generational movement where people like you, for the same reasons that are your reasons, uh, want to help achieve accountability and good government? Uh, I'd like to say it's growing. Uh, I think we're quite a number of um, lawyers or even human rights defenders who are uh, assisting uh, victims uh, access uh, regional uh, mechanisms. So it's quite a, a growing number. I wouldn't say we're a few. <laughs> uh, we're quite many interested in uh, what regional systems have to offer. It's not just at the African level, but there's also at the sub-regional level. So let's say, for example, with the East African community, you have the East African Court of Justice. And so um, a number of lawyers are also making use of um, sub-regional courts like East African Court of Justice or in, in the West African uh, region, you have the ECOWAS uh, Court uh, to pursue um, human rights cases. 
So yeah, I think it's, uh, we're definitely using uh, the various avenues we have at our disposal to seek good governance and um, accountability. These are principles that states have, I mean, um, uh, signed on to. And so we are definitely using this to hold them to their word, if I could say that. Good. Well, you know, let me say, and I say this to the people who are doing similar work in Ukraine, um, you're not just representing your ostensible clients, so to speak. You're really representing the whole world uh, at achieving a, a better moral standard, uh, a better world order. So I admire you for that, and I wish we could spend more time. And, and I'd you. like to fly right over to Kampala and, and meet you in person and say hi. But <laughs> that may not yeah, happen right away. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia. Cynthia Ibale uh, with uh, Project Expedite just as a, an attorney working in Kampala on matters arising out of uh, the events in, in uh, uh, Sudan. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.